We knew it was coming. Whoa, Toby, Toby. Toby, 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 Robin. Anyways, I just watched his explosive run on Jamina Begum and also his documentary exposing Panorama, Panadrama, I think it's called, and the BBC. <clears throat> it seems like a lot of people are going on a, the wave of Tommy Robinson, some kind of hero, exposing the BBC, and loads and loads of people are now, boom, cancelling my TV licence, I'm cancelling my TV licence, rah, rah, rah. Now, if you're just into hating Islam, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not religious, um, but if, if you're just into hating Islam, then boom, do your thing in it, whatever, you're not really going to be interested in any truth, but if you're into any kind of truth and seeking truth in this crazy fucked up world, and you're only now cancelling your TV licence because of what Tommy Robinson's saying, then you are way, way off track. You are way behind. Way behind. Common misconception that the BBC is a publicly owned body um, is potentially not for profit or something. You know, people have these misconceptions about the BBC. The BBC, you can go on any public houses website, type it in on Google, and they have shareholders. You know what I mean? They are they are not an impartial, publicly owned publicly, I mean it's publicly funded but it's not publicly owned so the idea that they would be impartial in it, I mean there are so many examples, like if you didn't cancel your TV licence after 9-11 with the whole Jane Stanley incident, I'll try to cop something in here, get some videos or something in it because you need to look at that you know, um, Building 7 where she reported Building 7 going down 20 odd minutes before it even happened there's a guy called, um Tony Rook, who took, well, didn't take the court, BBC took him to court in 2013 because he said that he's not paying his TV licence because under Section 28, I think it was, or something, um, of the Terrorism Act, they knowingly had prior knowledge to a terrorist act and didn't say anything about it, and the proof is in the broadcast, the fact that she reported it before it happened. Um... 7-7, seven, seven. there's an amazing documentary, uh, there's two actually, there's part one and then there's, um, it's called uh, Ripple Effect by Muad Deeb, a uh, Muslim guy from Ireland and the BBC actually went over to Ireland, caught him on his, like, this is like a relatively elderly gentleman, you know, he's, I, think, I think he was in his late 60s at the time, um, Went over to Ireland, the BBC did. Harassed him on his way back from the shops. I said, I'm laughing, but it's, it's, this is the reality of the situation. So, yeah, they harassed him on his way back from the shops anyway. Interviewed him, like, oh, why, why are you lying about 7-7? Seven, seven? Why are you a terrorist sympathiser? All the, all the general shit. Anyways, they fought for him to get extradited from Ireland and come to England. And he was imprisoned for quite a while I think it was like three months or something don't quote me on that but look into that his, his, his documentary is fantastic you know they, they doctored images um I mean if you believe 9-11 is an original story you need to go back because that's where a lot of that's where I kind of started in this thing I mean that was many many years ago when I was really quite young um but if you believe the general narrative of 9-11 then psh, Go back, same with 7-7, seven, seven. watch Murad Deep's documentary, uh, it's called Ripple Effects, watch both parts in it. Um, but when it comes back round to the original point again, with with this whole actor situation, he's portraying to you, like, I'm giving you the truth, this is fake news, I'm giving you real news, this is real journalism, I'm giving you truth for our uh, Why don't you give us truth about your name? Or where you come from. Or where your funding is coming from. How you know these people. Hmm? Seems evident to me. Why? Because the real agenda. The same with most of these people. 
the black and white effect of duality, the actual agenda is quite, quite different to the one portrayed, to the unlearned, to the uninitiated. But, I mean, like I say, for all I know, it could be a joint, a joint effort to uh, get some sort of independent news platforms rolling and create. The, the, the whole ethos of a lot of these things goes back to the same old bullshit ancient occult is things with the whole divide and conquer and order out of chaos so where this seems chaotic and the BBC is all fucked and rah 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 it creates discourse and they can bring about order in where to direct you to get your new free independent real truth news from you see with this animated character and these foolish views Jimmy Savile raped did some awful things to so many people and it's evidence that it was covered up by those inside that company and you ain't see thousands of people outside the BBC offices in Manchester then you're not getting vexed because you, you vexed because of Tommy Robinson went and actually did break the law you cannot commit contempt of court warned of course if there is you know what I mean you can't take photos and be saying certain things when 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 the jury is deliberating on such a high profile thing why would you want to jeopardize justice if you're so worried about these little girls and the whole thing with this Shimmy Begum as well and the next point actually coming back to all this shit don't get me wrong that like, I, I don't know where I stand like I say with all this sort of stuff Knowing what I know, I can't take the official narrative at face value and believe it. But in his video, when he goes live and talks about her and her kid, and rah, rah, he does. So for the, for the benefit of this, we'll take it at face value the same way that he does. And he talks about it not being an accident. Oh, it's not It's not a mistake. It's not a, it's not a fucking mistake. Stealing from the shops when you're all 15 is a mistake. Doing this is a mistake. Oh, it's a mistake. Is committing fraud to get into another country under a different name a mistake? Is not telling us why on your supposed, supposed authentic passport your name is Paul Harris? You know, is that a mistake? Is it a mistake to head the EDL in army fatigue now that you're looking all grown up and you're a journalist? Going out in army fatigue, antagonising Muslims and stuff like that, I don't know. Was it? Was, was it even a mistake doing contempt of court the way you did it? I don't know. But to suggest that a 15-year-old girl definitely did it. I'm not saying she... I mean, obviously, in her videos and stuff, she says that she doesn't regret it and rah, rah, rah. Which, to be honest, personally, I find slightly more comforting. Had she come out and been like, oh, I'm a refugee. I fucking hate it. I'm, I'm a victim of fucking war crimes. I, they did some evil things. I'm I'm brute. I'm terrorised. And then we... we oh, she would have got loads more sympathy from the general public had she done that. But she didn't. She said she didn't regret it. She weren't really traumatised. And there's obviously loads of people that are in war type situations and, and she probably knew what she was getting into. So, to a certain extent, anyway. So, yeah, maybe she isn't affected by it too much. I don't know. But then again, I don't think, especially at her young age, through being there from such a young age as well, that you could really self-diagnose that and say that it hasn't affected you. But either way, getting off her, saying that it's definitely not a mistake. I know for a fact that this Tommy Robinson character's reply, maybe not Stephen Lennon's reply, but this Tommy Robinson character's reply, had it been a white girl that had been coerced or groomed or persuaded or chose to, of her own free will, go and do some crazy ass shit like that, she would have been groomed. It would not be a, a case of, it's her mistake, rah, 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 you know? 
It, it wouldn't be a case of that. That would not be the Tommy Robinson character's reply at all. She would have been groomed and forced and made to do all manner of things against her will. You know, I can, I can literally hear what he would say if it was a white girl that had been in the same situation doing the same shit. Um, again, not that I can take the official narrative, but if I do, then I'm not sure what I think of it. I mean, if they're going to revoke her citizenship, then you probably should have done that when she left the country or put a warning out before like, when this shit kicked off that anyone that decides to leave the country in favour of IS and is is found to be over there from this country you automatically revoke your citizenship. You know what I mean? That should have been something that was there from the start. But it's not because that's not how things work and it not being how things work. Yeah man. This guy's a character. Actor, not Spartan Truth. Fuck the BBC TV license and fuck these idiot fools that claim they're giving you independent, anti establishment, truth based, free media because it's not true. They're liars, the same as the rest of them. Spartan bullshit, trying to get you to part with your hard earned money that more time us working people can only get through physical labour on motherfuckers like that that are receiving £10,000 a month and still taking two, mil two million pounds worth of donations he got actually from people. How about you saying people donate two million of aid to Syria aid or something, do you know what I mean? And like, make sure your money gets somewhere and then the immigration problem might be a little, <laughs> do you see what I mean? Because when was the last time people two million pound? How about we all funding two million pound and re rehouse the people from Grenfell? That are thinking that Tommy Robinson is giving you some kind of fucking truth. Quit that shit. That motherfucker being mind controlled himself to mind control you. Is it me? Break free. <laughs> I'm not trying to sound condescending that it was, it was, it's, it's just one of those though like I cannot stress enough how much this shit is fake like straight fake like the irony is so so strong at that common sense tells you that on all sides of conflict who's right and wrong is totally subjective I mean, that goes back to the main point of why, whether it was a mistake or not. Because I think in that video, he says that, that her dad um, went on, like, marches against America. Um, you know, anti-West marches or whatever. Um, and he was friends with Lee Rigby's killer, apparently. Obviously, I can't confirm any of these things, but Tommy Robinson says that. So, if that is the case, and that is true, I mean, again, like, with the whole Lee, Lee Rigby murder... You have to look into that if you haven't from some next angles. Um, Reevaluate these situations because any of these high profile incidents that are put to us are usually put to us for the purpose of changing public perception. You know what I mean? They, they make people's emotions control their rational thinking, or not control it, or, or override it, override rational thinking with, with, um, with emotion. You know, if there's kids involved, who the f do you know what I mean, most people fucking, and rightly so, because that's how most compassionate people work. But that's where they take advantage of us, because these people that create these situations aren't compassionate. They're psychopaths. They don't give a fuck. Sociopaths, you know, they're, they're all, all of them. Mr. Lennon, Mr. Harris included. There's many, like that, that's just a, a, a BBC type um, scenario, you know? But there's many governmental 
cover ups and so I mean obviously we're just talking about the coverage, but where where did the if you look at the more deep documentary for instance, now we're talking now we're looking at, you know, MI five and and other such government faculties. Um so yeah. If you're seeking truth, fuck the BBC, fuck this character, Tommy Robinson. Fight for yourself. Because if you're looking for some sort of a figure to lead you, you will always be misled. Most of the time, anyway, you know. But people like that who are trying to create movements all the time and do all this crazy ass shit publicity stunt I mean him get he knew that he was going to be arrested and imprisoned for for contempt of court it was just a ridiculous move but more than likely a PR stunt you know a few months in jail shitload of money he, he's in that documentary he comes out he goes oh I come out I come out of jail I had no idea how bad things were or what was going on or right, right. he knew exactly what was going on that's a fucking lie he's a liar I mean, again, maybe Tommy Robinson didn't know what's going on, but Paul Harris and Stephen Lennon definitely knew what the fuck was going on. All these high-profile sort of things that keep happening with him, with like Twitter, and he's been banned from Facebook. Or same shit. It's opposite thinking. You know, it's 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 a simple like fucking, um, can't think of the word, but it, it's it's a simple, you know, backwards thing. They're making making it all the systems out to get him. Look, look at all these sites trying to shut him down and silence him. Everyone's trying to silence him. So now you think that he's actually some sort of fucking truth-speaking independent motherfucker that needs to be shut down because he's going to get people into trouble for speaking so much truth, which is not the case, you know? If you speak so much truth, it starts at home. Tell us why your passport called you Paul Harris, but you was actually incarcerated under Stephen Lennon, but every single thing you do with regards to this high-profile media bullshit is under the guise of Tommy Robinson. A completely different person. That's that's character impersonation. You've stolen someone's identity. That's fraud within itself. <sighs> but yeah, wake the fuck up, people. If you're cancelling your TV license after Tommy Robinson said so, told you to do it. Because Tommy Robinson told you to do it. Because Tommy fucking Robinson told you to do it. You're doing it. You know what I mean? If you're cancelling your TV lives after Tommy Robinson told you to do it, you didn't cancel it after 9 11, you didn't cancel it after 7 7, you didn't cancel it after Jimmy Savile, you didn't cancel it after fucking Syria and the chemical attacks, you didn't cancel it after fucking any of that bullshit. Boy. You didn't even cancel it after, you know what I mean? You see people getting harassed by these fucking idiots that come around your house. You didn't cancel it after they told you that they had detector vans that would come around and sense, like, fucking detect whether you was gonna, whether you was watching TV or not. You know what I mean? Making threats, threatening you and your family that you must pay this fee because we can detect it. And surely you're fucking tells you that that shit ain't fucking true. Ain't no one ever been caught from a fucking detective van. But yeah, you still bent over and paid it. But now you don't want to bend over because Tommy Robinson has said to stand the fuck up. Because Tommy Robinson told you. Have it in this twisted world. In this twisted ass world. Think for yourself. You really have to think for yourself. These people are out to deceive us. That's the only job. I mean, why is he getting paid £10,000 a month? Because he's doing a very, very, very good job. A good job of what? Not being a fucking journalist. Being a mass 
deceiver with a big public influence. Because whether you follow him, whether you don't, his movements create ripples. Hence why I'm doing this. I should have started doing these a long time ago, but man's slacking. But I should be doing more, so yeah. Don't take anything I say as as, as facts. Like I say, go and watch the Murder Deep documentary. Go and watch Tony Rook's interview after he comes out of court and says that the judge looked at his evidence on BBC knowing prior to... Censorship is real. Censorship is real. Censorship is real. People. Now, this has never been played on television before, but it has a particular uh, relevance. Let's listen to this. So who else is on the goner list? Oh, it's endless, believe me. I just want to make a film of it. On film, I'd like to kill Jimmy Savile. I think he's a hypocrite. When I write... I bet he's into all kinds of seediness. That we all know about, we're not allowed to talk about. I know some rumours. <laughs> I bet none of this will be allowed out. I shouldn't imagine libelous stuff will be allowed out. Nothing I said is liable. Is in a Croydon. Marcus Dow, are you shocked by what you've seen there last night? No, not at all. I have been living in London for 50 years. There are so many different moods and moments. But what I was certain about, listening to my grandson and my son, is that something very, very serious was going to take place in this country. Our political leaders had no idea. The police had no idea. But if you looked at, at, at young blacks and young whites with a discerning eye and a careful hearing, they have been telling us, and we would not listen, that what is happening in this country to them Mr. Wrong. Howe, if I can and just if I can just wrong. stop you, Mr. Howe, for a moment, you're not. You say you're not shocked. Does this mean that you condone what happened in your community last night? I condone. If I, of course not. What I'm going to condone it for? What I am not. What I'm concerned about more than anything else. There is a young man called Mark Duggan. He has parents. He has brothers. He had sisters, and few yards away from he live, where he lives, a police officer blew his head off. Well, Mr. Howe, we have to... Off with a, let me finish. Mr. Howe, we, we have to wait and for the official the inquiry before we can say things like that. We don't know what happened to Mr. Duggan. We are going to wait for the police report on it. I, if I can I, take I, you I on a little bit, uh, you Mr. were talking Duggan about your grandson, dead. you were talking about you young people. You were talking about your grand... The headlines at nine o'clock. In the past hour, there have been three major explosions on the London Underground. The first occurred at ten past eight on the Piccadilly line between Knightsbridge and Hyde Park Corner. The second at 16 minutes past eight on the central line between Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Circus. And the third at 27 minutes past eight as a train was arriving at Vauxhall Station from Stockwell on the Victoria Line. Emergency services have been called to all three scenes. There are no reports available yet on the number of casualties, and the police have said that it's too early to identify a possible cause. London Underground is now closed, and the police are asking people not to travel. 350,000 people alone are making their way towards the city of London at this point. And if the access overload system has been triggered and they can't get onto the mobile telephones, this will have pr profound indications for them, the next of kin. We can now confirm that a tanker carrying chlorine has exploded at the junction of Shoreditch High Street and Commercial Street. Chlorine is extremely toxic in this form and the police are issuing express warnings to people to stay indoors, close windows and remain there until the all clear is given. In the days leading up to 7-7-2005, there were hoax bomb scares in Nottingham and Sheffield. 
Were these false alarm hoaxes meant not only to cause panic and confusion, but also to lull everyone into a false sense of security, and into thinking that the initial reports in London on 7-7-2005 would also be false? On April the 7th last year, a chemical attack in the Syrian city of Douma reportedly killed 70 people. However, this has now been questioned by a BBC Syria producer who claims footage of the aftermath may have been staged. It's a line which both Russia and Damascus have long maintained, despite many others accepting the footage at face value. RT's Murad Gazdiev has more. You don't hear it very often, not even a doubt, not a suspicion, but a certainty that the hospital scenes of the alleged chemical attack in Douma were staged. And this is coming from a BBC Syria producer. After almost six months of investigations, I can prove without a doubt that the Douma hospital scene was staged. No fatalities occurred in the hospital. The incident in question occurred almost a year ago. Here, by the way, is how BBC reported on the incident back then. Disturbing reports of a chemical weapons attack. Chemical attack carried out by the Assad regime. The medics are doing what they can, but they're overwhelmed. Dozens of people have been killed due to poison gas. A chemical attack did happen, believes Riam, but everything else, the casualties, the panic, the videos, those were meant to achieve something. It seems not for the first time full-blown hysteria over supposed chemical attack casualties may not quite be how it's claimed. Well, we contacted the BBC for comments. They said the producer in question was expressing his personal opinions about the footage, and he never said the attack didn't happen. Sendry bomb dropped onto a school playground in the north of the country, which has left scores of children with napalm-like burns over their bodies. It's just absolute chaos and carnage here. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looked like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of chemical weapon. I'm not really sure. Like it must be some sort of chemical weapon, I'm not really sure. Like it must be some sort of, and I'm not really sure, maybe napalm, something similar to that. Like it must be some sort of chemical weapon, I'm not really sure. Like it must be some sort of, and I'm not really sure, maybe napalm, something similar to that. The air is still thick with the smell of whatever liquid, whatever chemical it was that was dropped here. And it's hard to imagine and hard to describe the horrors of what the pilot did that day. They arrived like the walking dead. We don't know for sure what was in the bomb, but the injuries and debris suggest something like napalm or thermite. There were no shrapnel injuries and little blood, just appalling burns. Among the medics here. Dear United Nations, you're recalling peace. You're calling for peace. What kind of peace are you calling for? Don't you see this? Don't you see this? What do you need to see? We are just see human beings. We want to live. You know? Isn't it our right to live? Isn't it? In a basic hospital funded by handouts, the emergency.
Please. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. There's almost a sense downtown in uh, New York behind me, down by the World Trade Centers, of uh, just an area completely closed off as the rescue workers try to do their job. But this isn't the first building that um, has suffered as a result. We know that part of the Marriott Hotel next to the World Trade Center also collapsed as a result of this huge amount of falling debris from 110 floors of two, the two twin towers of the World Trade Center. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. That's what you would hope, because this whole downtown area behind me has been completely sealed off and evacuated, apart from the emergency workers. That was done by the mayor, Rudy Giuliani, uh, much earlier today, uh, because of, the, of course, the dreadful collapse of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. But uh, New York, very much a city still in chaos. The phones are not working properly. The subway lines are not working properly. And we know that down there, near the World Trade Center, there are three schools that um, are being turned into triage centers for emergency treatment and I know that over in New York Harbor where the famous Statue of Liberty is there's a field hospital where 1500 people are being treated and we have heard though it's unconfirmed as yet that a hundred New York City police officers have been taken there as well for treatment but we do need to confirm uh, those figures for the officers it's now, what, some eight hours since the attacks. Is there any estimate yet available of the number of casualties in the World Trade Center? I think we can only go at this point with the words expressed by the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, that it's too frightening to think how many there could be. We know that uh, it's about almost 300 people on the airliners that were used in these attacks. But you've got to remember, this was 9 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday morning. It's busy in downtown Manhattan in the financial district then. The World Trade Center itself has 50,000 workers. There are tens of thousands of tourists who go up there every day. The figures are almost too frightening to, to contemplate. You can understand why nobody yet wants to put a figure on them. Listen. And, um, so I went into my local police station where my father used to work. And the only reason I got past the first herd of the front desk is that there was a, a chap there who worked with my dad. And he said, well, why are you here? And I said, I want to report a crime. And I told him what the crime was, 9-11 and all this stuff, and 7, seven. And uh, why? And he said, what does your dad think about this? And I said, well, he's, he's, uh, he's seen it and he's, he's not happy about the, the official story either. So they then got this uh, very glamorous uh, police officer down sat there and questioned me, he didn't take any notes, but I told her what I knew, um, passed her um, in the course of the next couple of weeks, um, some evidence, hard copy, etc. Um, and asked her what she'd done with it, and she confirmed it had been passed to Division of Intelligence and Sussex Police. Uh, Some time later, uh, about a year later, somebody knocked on my door, which was TV licensing. Um, uh, I, I said, look, I'm not paying your license under Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act. Um, and they went through the procedure. I got the court summons, uh, went to court. They asked me if I was guilty. I said, no, I'm not guilty of having an appropriate license because the license isn't appropriate because I'll be funding terrorism because I know the BBC's covered up the true events of the day. And eventually we arrive here today and um, the result has been 
and I have to say a fair judge in my opinion, um, that I have not been convicted. Uh, I have no fine. Uh, court costs £200, which you guys have very generously donated to. Um, and I have to behave myself and get a TV licence, of course, which I'll be running down the post office tomorrow to buy. <coughs> Um, but hopefully we've set a little a little precedent here where it might encourage people to go and do the same thing and uh, you know go to their police, tell them about today, um, give them the evidence. Uh, West Sussex Police have said they're investigating it, which they're obliged to do because the BBC had prior knowledge of a terrorist event, which under I think Section 38 of the Terrorism Act uh, they should have reported, which they didn't, and they've since given this. Uh, since given us this impossible flannel about World Trade Center 7 collapsing due to an office fire, which uh, even in the NIST report says uh, fell at free fall speed for eight floors in, in 2.5 seconds. Now that is absolutely impossible. Sexual abuse spanning 40 years and questions are being raised about child protection at the BBC as well as allegations of a cover-up. The chairman of the BBC Trust in his first public comment on the affair, called it a cesspit and promised a review of the BBC's guidelines on child protection. But he insisted there had been no corporate cover-up. The allegations that Savile assaulted teenage girls were made in this television documentary. Since the programme aired earlier this month, emphasising his links with the famous, scores of victims and witnesses have come forward. Mate, do I need to state the obvious? Is it not uh, absurd and offensive that you are complicit in covering up child abuse at and within your own corporation? Is that not absurd? Um, basically, um, I've got an agent with mission control, people give stuff and stuff, and um, I think that's kind of where I'm, I'm most known for at the moment. So the BBC run mission control, and it was looking at It's a surprise for me too. Um, basically, um, I've got an agent with mission control, people give stuff and stuff, and um, I think that's kind of where I'm, I'm most known for at the moment. So the BBC run mission control, and it was looking at So the BBC run some of the abuse is alleged to have taken place in hospitals where Savile did charity work, as well as the BBC. It's been revealed that its flagship television current affairs programme dropped a planned investigation into the claims, but executives say it was for editorial reasons alone. We went straight to the police with it as soon as we, as soon as we had a sense of the scale of what had been going on. And you're happy with your role in this, are you? I'm, 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 I'm entirely convinced that I've done all the right things, yeah, yeah. This has been the fall of a man who was to many a national hero. Now even his ornate gravestone has been removed by family out of respect for public opinion. The problem of BBC impartiality was not that BBC reporters and presenters would step in front of the camera and say, vote Labour. Uh, it wasn't a question of people actually espousing a, a particular open political loyalties in public. It was that throughout the culture of the BBC, you caught on the edge of a, on the edge of a remark, or you caught through the selection, or the arrangement, or the order of events, or the way in which persons were treated, or the tone of voice in which they were questioned, the fact that the BBC held a point of view. Unveiling wasn't quite the triumph that grassroots well, uh, out would have hoped. Well, not for the first time. You've misled me. Uh, by asking me to come in and talk about the referendum, but instead wanting to talk about me. I'm sure we if haven't you, misled you. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no, I'm no, sure no, we I haven't misled you. No, I won't hang on. If you had told me what, that, I was coming in, that I was coming in to discuss me, I would have said there are much bigger issues that the British people are occupied by than six or however many vox pops but you had. But this is going on to people. the issue, as you say, of the referendum. Well, because the, it's let's talk powerful. about the referendum. All right, but just, let's, let's just talk be, about well, the yes, referendum. But I want you to Shall answer we? this. You want to defend you know, what you're doing here. I don't here. want to defend me at all. You're not my judge. You're not fit to be my judge. Well, thank you very much.